Hello, Jake. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? I'm well. We are live, and how are you? Well, it's good to be live, and it's good to be alive, and I am fine. Uh, it's good. All, all good here. Um, yeah, so you suggested something, um, and when we caught up recently, it was quite funny. I think we sent, was it Skype message, or was it a, a WhatsApp message? I one of one of these kind of messages mm -hmm. um, and i was like oh, wouldn't it be a good idea to do one about technology wouldn't it be good to do um, a podcast all about technology and that was off the back of um of a uh, uh a news article that i saw about this some um, hypersonic flight um so spaceship uh, not spaceships rather uh, airplanes that aren't supersonic but hypersonic in other words they can do up to fifteen thousand kilometers an hour which is extraordinary. Um, or was it 15,000 miles an hour, which is even more extraordinary. It's about 20 odd thousand kilometers. So in other words, you can get from London to Sydney in just a couple of hours, which just blew my mind. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing? We should discuss all the technology because there's just so much stuff happening in the world of technology that's really going to change our, our world um, mm -hmm. very quickly. And then you reminded me, <laughs> Um, that we were going to do a talk on memory, and yeah. I completely forgotten. <laughs> so I think you were right. We we re definitely definitely need to do one on memory because I need to improve my memory. Well, um, I didn't mind doing either one of them because, uh, as you know, I've been well. I've, I've mentioned a couple of times I've been binge watching um, documentaries on Netflix, and uh, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole too much, but. Um, I watch one on the three D printing stuff. Mm. There's a lot of interesting things happening there. Um, Amazing, yeah. But yeah, uh, if you wanted to start, if you want to do the memory call, that's fine by me. Um, and um, would you like to start with the word of the day? I would love to start with the word of the day. But just before we do, though, can I just make a point, which is, uh, I, I was thinking about the word of the day because I I love doing the word of the day at the beginning of every podcast. Uh -huh. But I was thinking, I can't remember, because this is about memory. And I'm thinking, how many words of the day can I actually remember? <laughs> um, and the truth of the matter is, I can barely remember what I had for breakfast. So <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, they are fantastic. So, so crack on. All right. The word of the day is abdicate. Uh, A-B-D-I-C-A-T-E. And the definition or a definition is to cast off or discard. Okay. Abdicate. So, abdicate uh, yeah. has royal connotations to me. So I, I always think of um, um, Edward and Mrs. Simpson. Yeah, you're right. Because one of the other definitions is to renounce a throne, high office, dignity or function. There you are. Okay. So yeah, Edward uh, married, um, oh sorry, King Edward, um, uh, who, he was, he was the king for about a year or something, I think, wasn't he? And, but he, he wasn't allowed to marry a, uh, it wasn't that she was a commoner or that she was American, it was the fact that she was divorced already. Um, and so that was, that was just too much for the establishment. So he had to <laughs> choose, didn't he, between Mrs. Simpson, who everyone calls as Mrs. Simpson, even though she was divorced, <laughs> so I mean, that's a bit odd. Um, so he had to choose between her and and being the king, and he chose her. Fair play, fair play, really, I suppose. I'd like it's actually a topic that I'd love to discuss on a call because um, the concept of, of a monarchy. Mm. I, I, I'd like, like I say, I'd love to talk about this because, in my view, it's one of those things that shouldn't exist. Yeah. And, uh, I'd like to hear some arguments as to why it should exist, other than perhaps "quote unquote" tourism, which is why what everyone says about it's a net benefit to the country. Yeah, um, I just think the, the idea that royalty exists in this day and age is is just it's absurd. Yeah, exactly. I'm not going to argue with you. That's the problem, Tom. <laughs> We're going to spend, spend the whole whole call agreeing with each other. Yes. Yeah. I think we're going to, uh, because I, I couldn't agree more. I think, um, um, you know, we should be, for me, right, we, we say that we live in a civilized society, 
Um, but I think, you know, when you really step back and look at it abstractly, are we really civilized? What's the definition of civilized? Um, well, frankly, I think part of the definition of civilized means that we don't have people who are um, who are living on the streets, um, people who need medical care that don't get it, um, people who you know are neglected by the state or by families or by people generally. I just don't think that that should exist, and so I don't think we we are really civilized. So for me. When we truly are civilized, everyone will have an equal opportunity to fulfill their own destiny. To you know, nobody will be held back. And I think poverty is a real big holder backer. Uh, I was thinking about Tesla the other day. You know, not the car, but the um, the inventor. Um, uh -huh. And you know, he was really he came up with this idea, um, which was to have free electricity. I mean, he, he, he came up with the concept of um, uh, alter, alternating current, which enables us really to, uh, to have electricity spread around without having a, a power station every few blocks. So he, was a, he, was a, he had a huge impact, but he was working with Thomas Edison. Um, and ultimately then he, he found some of his ideas came into direct conflict with Edison and with all the investors in that he was coming up with a concept of free wireless electricity. Um, could you imagine, this is over 100 years ago, mm. could you imagine if, you know, if we were living in a, in a system where we weren't always desperately trying to look for um, profit, uh, we weren't profit motivated, but we were ideas motivated, you know? I'm not, I'm not advocating communism or anything like this. I'm simply saying that someone could just come up with a good idea and not be restricted by by finance which is ultimately what what restricts a lot of people from achieving their goals um, i think there are some some instances of that uh, mm. but i think uh, I, I like there's some polio i think polio example so yeah uh he came up with the cure and then said and there were some people interested in um you know selling the cure and he said no i'm not not mm. interested in selling it is for everyone and then yeah. obviously that goes away um and then i mean uh, i don't i'm not great on this topic but isn't um isn't that what solar is about um, like once you get solar panels isn't that sort of the equivalent of free electricity that I might be a really dumb comment i'm not i don't know i'm not really that sure about solar power my understanding is that you get subsidized by the state and then what happens is that um if you produce more electricity than you need, or in other words, the electricity that you get, it gets pumped into, into, the, into the grid, the national grid. And then effectively, you, if, you, if you generate more electricity than you use, then you get free electricity and the rest goes into the grid. Um, in the UK, solar panels are not the most efficient in the world. Um, generally because there's hardly any sun um, but in certain parts of the world solar panels are, are way more efficient and the technology keeps improving but um yeah i i know what you mean but i think that's a problem that's a solution or a potential an idea about a potential solution to a problem um, and that there are roofs everywhere and ultimately i imagine all roofs will eventually become solar panels yeah um, and and then you know we are truly, because the thing is that energy is free and it's available in abundance. I mean, there's way more energy available to us than we could ever possibly use. I mean, it's just an unlimited, abundant source of energy it comes from just the sun and there are billions of suns. So even if, you know, for whatever reason, there's a limit to the amount that we could harness from our sun, um, then, you know, we could use if we ever got to that stage we'd probably have the ability to go to other suns and harness their energy so um there, there are different stages of civilization apparently and we're pretty near the beginning of it um, um uh, that that would be a topic for another 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 talk but um i might have got the stat wrong but i think it's something like uh for per year the sun mm. generates ten thousand times more electricity than we use something like that 
Well, that's not a lot. I would have thought it was way more than that. But still, that's way more than we need. 10,000 um, times more than we need. Yeah, ten, yeah actually, 10,000 times more. Um, well, anyway, I mean, I, I think the thing is that what I was going to say with Tesla is that his was not uh, necessarily the answer to a, you know, he, he wasn't looking for the solution to a problem. Rather, he was just looking at an idea and thinking, wow, we can do that with it. Imagine being able to have free electricity, free power for everybody, you know. And this is for him a concept that was, I guess, his defining, the defining, you know, concept of his life. And I mean, he came up with an awful lot of incredible inventions. Um, but this was one of them. Um, and wireless electricity. So you don't need any plug. I ha I currently have my computer plugged into the wall to charge it. So we're not talking about batteries. We're talking about electricity that sort of goes along through the electro I mean the electromagnetics of the earth or however it works I I really don't know um and it's spread out there and certain uh technical devices can pick it up and use it and therefore there is free energy for them um how you produce the electricity in the first place is another is another issue altogether but he came up with this idea of no cables no nothing free abundant electricity for everybody mm. and and he was bankrupted and basically um, ridiculed and his um yeah and, and he was basically bullied out of business as far as i can tell by the edisons of this world and um you know there's there's some fantastic documentaries in fact there's one that's just recently come out i think about him which i haven't seen yet but um you know i, know I may have my edison. facts wrong Oh, yeah, because yeah, Edison is glorified as a, the type of individual that you want to model as a uh, from the perspective of perseverance. Yeah, so I've heard different numbers on this, but the numbers vary from when he was trying to create the light bulb, somewhere mm. between one thousand and ten thousand attempts at creating the light bulb. Yeah, and it depends on who's saying it, but um, even if it's the lower end of the scale, it's quite a uh, quite a feat. Well, this is the interesting thing, because we'll never really know the answer to these questions. And history, as I say, is written by the winners. And Edison was a winner. Um, Tesla wasn't, but he just came out <laughs> with... Say maybe it was 10 times. Maybe he got it on his 10th time, but just well, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Or I don't, I'm not even sure that he got it, and it, well, he, wasn't, he didn't just take it from somebody else. You know? um, and certainly Tesla and lots of people like him at one stage worked for Edison. So there were a lot of people who came up with concepts um, because he was the head. He was the sort of figurehead. He, it's like, you know, a king building a palace. Well, the king. You know what? There's, a there's a perfect example of this, and it's, um, you know, how everyone sort of says how what a genius Steve Jobs was. Yeah. And um, you know, he had this, this sort of great innovation, and he brought us the iPod and the iPad and the iMac, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the iPhone. And really, <laughs> Bill Baer does a, a good bit on this where he says, um, really, all he was doing was shouting at the intelligent people. Like, I, I want all this music on this small device. And they were like, <laughs> oh, OK. And then like all these intelligent people went to work on it, and he presented it. All he was doing was sort of you know, motivating people. And, there you are. Uh, the, uh, yeah. the smart people were uh, in the background sort of but not taking credit for their work. No, but that's it. Wozniak is is one of them as well, isn't he? You know, yeah. Steve Wozniak. So he he yeah, you're right. Maybe his his particular talent was not the inventive side of things, but the 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 sort of the creative side in in looking solving problems or putting things, you know, getting other people, organizing other people to do the work, which I think uh, is having a vision, isn't it? Yeah, so it's an admirable quality in its own right, but um yeah, but yeah, he he he's certainly the one that sort of mops up all the glory. Yeah. I, I'd just like, just before we move away from that subject, I'd just like to say that I think um, I think uh, Apple is one of the most extraordinary companies. I mean, they they are the Coca Cola of the technology world. I mean, you know, if I, I had I used to live, I had a flatmate when I was uh, at university, and he only would drink Coca Cola. He had to have two cans of Coca Cola every day, um, and he. You wouldn't have Pepsi, nothing else, just Coca-Cola. And, um, you know, and, and I'd say, well, you know, have you tried Pepsi? What do you think about it? What do you think about the different types of Coca-Cola? 
Um, and ultimately, he was totally and utterly uh, besotted with the brand. He was so loyal to Coca-Cola that it didn't matter that the other ones might be tastier or anything. He was going to stick with Coca-Cola. And that's exactly the, si the, the kind of brand loyalty that, that um, Apple have. They came out with the iPhone, and it was revolutionary in its time. But, you know, I, I know that I don't want to create any arguments here, but... Um, but, you know, the Android phones have, have come up so much and they're far cheaper. Uh, and effectively, I know their um, operating system is a bit different, but ultimately they do the same job as, as the iPhone, but they're, they're much less likely to have a cracked glass. You could change the batteries. Um, there's all sorts of sort of real benefits to having, you know, uh, I don't want to mention brands, but... Uh, but, you know, another phone, another smartphone, which isn't an iPhone. And yet there are so many people that you meet who would only ever buy iPhone. They've only ever had iPhones and they're only ever going to have iPhones regardless. And, you know, you even get people who get the next iPhone, which is almost almost identical to the to one they've currently got. But there's a slightly better used. camera. Yeah, exactly. Maybe but it's, it's an additional megapixels. Yeah. The rest yeah, is the same. The, you've got to take your hat off, though. I mean, this is brand loyalty, and he's, you know, he's created this company. Where he created a company which, which really owned that. That's that's second only, in my opinion, to the church. I did hear um, that they don't have the majority of the market, though. Um, Apple no. have something like three times the profits, or the the iPhone rather has three times the profits of the other companies, right. but they don't have the majority of the market. So they've just decided to sort of raise their prices, mm. or just um, sort of say that they're they focus on quality rather than quantity. Um, so mm. I think Samsung does have more buyers, but it mm. has something like a third of the profit of, of Apple. Well, yeah, I can understand that. I mean, they, you know, I, I like Samsung, I've had a few Samsungs, and they've always been good. And they've lasted a long time. You know, I've, I've still got uh, Samsung, just need to replace the battery for it um, that I bought years ago. And it still works. It's, you can still download apps and the apps still work on it. The operating system is fine. Um, you know, it, it does a good job. But, um, but yeah, if it, ultimately, um, you know, most of the iPhones that I've seen have had cracked glass. Um, and this, to me, is a design flaw. But to uh, Apple, it may be, you know, fantastic design on their part because, you know, additional glass... source of revenue. Exactly. You know, maybe that's why they've not corrected that. But I, 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 the issue I, with batteries, the batteries are designed to last only so long. Yeah. And you can't take them out, can you? It's, it's not something that you can easily take out. Whereas on, a, on a mo most phones, you can take the batteries out easily and, and the SIM cards and all the rest of it. Mm. Um, anyway, if you're not uh, careful. Um, yeah. This call is not going to be about <laughs> memory techniques. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. We've abdicated uh, the memory side of things. Does that work? I'm not sure. We'd cut, cast off or discard, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, not, not quite yet, but if we're not careful, we will. Um, okay, well, I, I just wanted to say, and I've forgotten my original point, but uh, when getting, talking about um, Tesla was that he, he had this vision and he was thwarted um and bankrupted because there was no profit in it and i wonder how many ideas and how how many concepts and how many people um are stopped from achieving greatness i mean you hear all these people say oh i want to be an actor or i want to be you know i want to do this i want to do that you you ask children what they want to do and none of them want to do a boring adult job they all want to do something fantastic and a lot of it is just they don't know much about the world and, and all the rest of it. But imagine there was no, everyone had um, an income that was enough to live on. Not enough to have a great life. But Are you income, talking you know, about universal basic income now? I guess I kind of am, except that, uh, you know, I invented this concept way before I ever heard that term. <laughs> okay. Um, it, it makes me think about, um, just, I'll just say one thing, which is um, sort of what you were referring to. Yeah, and, uh, they were talking about what the great minds of past times used to do. So it's like yeah. 50s, 60s. And you mm -hmm. would find that all of these sort of great intelligent minds would go and be scientists and sort of solve the world's problems. 
Yeah. Saying now the trend is that they are all going off and being brokers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> going to work in the stock that. market. Because there's more money in it. There's a lot more money in it. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's a real shame. Um, and so they're not following their dream, but perhaps they're thinking, well, I'll do this for a few years and then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do what I want then. And maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking about that as well in the past. Um, when you think of the, all the great literature that we, you know, we 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 hear about, we read about Shakespeare, and you know, all, all of the sort of uh, I don't know, um, in, from the Victorian times, you know, um, a lot of the people um, who wrote these great works of art or these works of literature. Um, they were able to finance themselves in some way. Um, if you had a coal miner, or the son of a coal miner, let's say, and instead of having an education, he had to work down the mine, um, and he never had any time to write, and he never, he never even learned to read and write, well, he may have in him the ability and, and everything to become one of the world's great writers or any, anything else in any other field, but just never have the opportunity to even realize that potential even exists in himself. So this is what I mean. And I think in, in, a, in a truly civilized society, um, we will all have the ability to um, at least have the opportunity to go for our dreams rather than having to settle for a, you know, a suburban lifestyle that we might not want. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's a tricky, tricky uh, topic, though. Yeah, I know. It's not easy. And this, you're talking about the, the topic of universal income. Um, personally, uh, I think that it will come eventually. It's, it must do. Because there's no, other, there's no way of financing society. There's, I think there's a big cliff. You know, there isn't enough money um, to finance all the, all the sort of the government services and things that we require. And there isn't enough money. Because all of... All of the government things rely on tax income. Um, and so the only thing that they can really do is either to reduce these things, make them more efficient, or uh, increase taxes. And those are the three options available to any government. So you either reduce the services. So they're talking about reducing the numbers of police on the streets, and therefore crime tends to go up. Um, or they make it more efficient. And generally, how do they make it more efficient? They introduce more technology, which is cheaper in the long run than paying someone's wages, which means that there's more people out of, out of work. But considering all government employees are paid through taxes, that's um, debatable as to whether that's, that's, you know, there's any kind of net benefit to employing people um, in terms of income uh, on a national scale. Obviously, on an individual scale, everyone needs employment. But... Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a difficult one. So I, I just don't know personally how a universal income could work, how it could be financed. But um, I'm sure somebody will figure it out one day. Because I think, um, you, know, the, you know, having lived in Spain, um, one of the big benefits to being in the UK is definitely not the weather. But it is uh, the, you know, the fact that people who've been sort of maybe young people have been able to claim unemployment benefit or sort of, or whatever and while they're unemployed use that money to cover their life uh, up to the point where they can actually do their music or write their books or the opportunity for the time you know they have to get out and earn money the whole time and and it's restricted their ability to create music or or to, you know, to, to write. I think anyone who really, really wants to will find a way. But, um, but, you know, there's a lot of stuff that gets in the way of that. Anyway, there you go. Um, no idea why we're talking about this, because we were going to talk about memory, if memory serves. We certainly were. <laughs> well, I don't know whether we, we do, we're too far down that road and we should do another one on memory another time. But uh, I'll leave that up to you. Um, yeah, there's no no reason why we can't cover it now. We can do half an hour on it. But um, mm. yeah, I'll kick it off if that's all right with you. Um, uh, there's like some simple ones that I was just going to cover off, which is um, a lot of people tend to use repetition to remember things. Mm. Um, so like language is a good example of that. And you'll know more than I will about this. Uh, you know, repetition in language is one of the things that 
uh, one of the tools which people use to remember things. Um, we talked about the sort of memory palace. I was yeah. going to add a few few things on on that because I've used it before. Mm. And one of the things I would do is use um, places that I know really well. So um, if you're trying to remember certain information. And so, it would be, sorry, this is the memory palace technique? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm not sure whether you would actually, you know, saying that it's a memory palace and then not using a memory palace. I'm not sure if that qualifies, but <laughs> an example would be um, like you would, you would use the, the rooms within your home to mm. put certain objects in to trigger your memory to remember certain things. So, um, and then once you have sort of uh, used that up, I can go into, for example, my garage or I can use my road or I can use my previous home, which is something that I've done before, or I can use where I go into work. So, you know, these are all places that you're, that you know very well, your visual sort of your unconscious or your, I'm sure what you refer to it as, but as you, visualizing things allows mm. you to remember them easier. So you, you visualize a room, for example, or, a, or a, a journey or a pathway or something like this. Yeah, so say you're, um, you're home. Um, yep. The first, so you enter the front door and you could even use that as one. So um, if you were trying to remember something in particular, um, you would find that when you entered the front door, let's say there was something on the handle when you tried mm. to get in, that something on the handle triggers the first part of what you're trying to remember. Okay. Um, so I, it would be really good to have an example here, but I can't seem to um, well, remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've got an example of this because I saw, you know, I really love Darren Brown and his stuff. Um, and he did a, an audio book um, on memory, which I'd recommend anyone who's interested in memory to, um, uh, to listen to. Um, and he used this technique. He, he talked about two different techniques, actually. One of them was the mind palace that you're referring to. And the other one was a technique for remembering names and, uh, when you first meet people. Um, and the mind palace one, he explained it like this. He said, Imagine a room that you know really well. So, uh, and, and this, the example that I can use is I did this with my two daughters um, years ago. And, um, and he said, imagine a room you knew really well. So we imagined the living room. Uh, and then I got my daughters to come up with 10 completely random uh, items. Okay. Uh, and, and then I did it with my daughters and I said, look, I wrote these items down on a piece of paper. I think there were 10 different, uh, different things. And we went, all of us together, the three of us, we went, we were actually in the room at the time as well, which kind of helped, I think. But we, we went around the room in a clockwise direction and we put an imaginary image of each item in that place. So the first item was Hello Kitty. Wait, I must just tell you that when we did this, was um let's see what are we now 2018 about 2012 we did this in 2012 and i've not really thought about it until now so i might not be able to remember all of the the items make it up no one will know <laughs> well the first item was hello kitty so we instead of thinking imagine hello kitty's on the tv uh because the tv was the first sort of you know item uh, looking towards straight ahead of the table where we were sitting. So we were looking at the TV to the right of the door. And then we went around the room back to where we were. And so uh, I said, OK, imagine Hello Kitty is sitting, looking really bored on the TV. Because the other thing as well is you have to, in order to remember the items, they can't just be logical. They have to be a little bit absurd. Because if it's absurd, it seems a bit weird. And you think that's odd. And it kind of provokes a different response in your memory. So you're, you're kind of using layering, I guess. So I imagined a really bored looking Hello Kitty sitting, dangling her legs over the TV. And so that was the first one. And then it was a pony. And so I imagined a pony running along the top, back and forth along the mantelpiece. Uh, and each time it gets to the end of the mantelpiece, it raised its legs and goes. Nyeh! So that was that. And then... We had a bookshelf next to the mantelpiece, and the next word was bed. 
So I imagined uh, that mantelpiece, uh, so the bookshelf actually wasn't a bookshelf at all. It was a pull down bed and it would just pull down and there was bed. Um, and then uh, the next word was sun. And so I imagined above the sofa, there was a sun um, and uh, there was a clock above the sofa. So I just imagined that the clock morphed into the sun and it was really sunny and beautiful and lovely. Um, and then, and then there was another one, which kind of was a bit obvious from sun, um, but it was beach. And I imagined that beneath the sun, the sofa, which was beneath the clock had turned into an amazing beach. And there it was. And there was the sun and the beach. Um, and then next to that, there was a table with a, uh, a, a light on it. Um, and aeroplane was the next thing. And I imagined a little aeroplane flying around and around and around above the, the light, trying to trying to find a landing place, like an insect might fly around a light, but it was a little aeroplane. Um, so uh, what else did we have? Now I'm starting to get a little bit lost. I think there was a hippopotamus, but I'm not entirely sure. And the, the other sofa that was, was there was the hippopotamus. Um, and there was a banana, um, and that was me holding a giant inflatable banana. Um, if you didn't get the first part of this call or the first <laughs> part of this introduction, it would be really weird to listen to. It would. But this, this is how I did it. And, you know, I did this in about, I think it was about 2012, and I literally have no memory at all. But I could remember, I can, what well, I mean now, 2018, so correct me if I'm wrong, but that's six years later. And I can remember most of these things, but I can also remember them in the reverse order. So yeah. if, you, if you told me bed, go in either direction. So I can tell you that bed, sun, beach, um, aeroplane, hippopotamus, banana. And if you want me to go the other way uh, from bed, I go bed, uh, pony, and Hello Kitty. And I can do it because I'm using this technique that you mentioned. But There's another way, because have you got an example, and I've, I've got one, if you haven't, hmm. of how you might use this uh, for beneficial purposes? No, that was why I struggled with it, because I thought, this is amazing, this technique is incredible. And for a couple of years, every now and again, we would just, uh, I would just say to one of my daughters, hey, check out this memory technique, look what she can remember. And I'd kind of explain this thing to her. So we kind of have, well, not for, not for a few years, but, um, you know, o o over the sort of several months after we, we first did that technique, and literally we learned all these things in about a couple of minutes. Um, and then we could, we could say all of these items and then all of them backwards or in any order and start from anywhere. And it was extraordinary. It was absolutely extraordinary, and anyone who's listening, you should absolutely try it out. I mean, I wonder if you, uh, if you, if you can remember the things that I've just said to you. You know, Hello Kitty, Pony, Bed, and so on. Um, well, it's but, all audio for me, so um, yeah. No, I, I wasn't visualizing it, but um, yeah. one of the yeah. things that I, that you can use this for is um, mm. for remembering numbers. So if you need to remember um, a certain number of uh, numbers in a particular order mm. you can pick objects which look like the number um, go through yeah. this story in your mind and it will tell you what the number is so an example of that might be um, you know you go into a room and there's a pole there the pole is um, the number one so you know that you, you know you're using that to start with oh. and then you uh, you know the the number two is like a a goose or something and you the, mm. the pole the goose is on the pole or you know it's, it's just an example of how you can remember uh, long numbers I what know. i think i don't know for certain but what i think is that have you seen those videos who um of the people who memorized the pi to oh, yeah. ridiculous amounts of blah, blah 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 yeah to many 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 digits thousands. yeah i think that they use this technique because you're just telling yourself a story mm. so if we were to attempt to remember large numbers i think it's somewhere between four and five mm. and people can't recall unless they've done it many many times they can't recall that number um, but whereas if you're telling yourself a story what my bet is is that even though you haven't watch the matrix in a very long time mm. you could describe that story to me yeah true. in great detail yeah it's, it's that's the same because with songs as well. stories. you know it's easier to remember things 
in song form but than it is just to remember a story outright so yeah that's one of the things i was going to add to your mm. um to your uh, objects is that when you use all of your various senses mm. um that also helps remembering so yeah. if one of your ob objects like smelt a particular way it might trigger the the memory mm. uh, so that you can remember it properly yeah um, that's funny um i i've had um when i was very very young i went to morocco with my with my mum um we spent she got a camper van and built a puppet theater and a friend of hers and i and my mum we spent six months driving down through france spain and morocco putting on um uh, a puppet show um with handmade puppets in local schools and town halls um all the way, yeah, all the way down to Morocco. And um, uh, my mum's original plan was to then go through Algeria and Tunisia and come up through Italy and, and sort of return back that way. But um, Algeria was a bit unstable at the time, so we just went to Morocco and came back. Um, it was an extraordinary um, experience for a very small child. I was about three, or three years old, I think. Um, but most children of three can't remember anything. But I remember flashes because it was so extraordinary, especially, uh, especially Morocco. Um, it's, it's just sights and sounds and smells and colors are so vivid and so vibrant and so exotic and different that I've got these flashes of memory that, that come from a much earlier age than otherwise would be. And um, certain smells, there's a, there's a certain smell even today. I've no idea what the smell is. I've never been able to pinpoint it. But when I smell it, and it's very rare that I do, but when I smell it, it transports me back to these memories and this sort of this feeling of nostalgia that I, I overwhelms me. And I, I desperately have to find out the source of the smell. And I've never yet been able to do so. So you're absolutely right. It's 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 the the secret to tech to technology to to memory is is depth, isn't it? It's enriching all of the the. It's it's utilizing as many of the senses as possible to sort of create a sort of almost 3D or 4D if you if you consider sort of talking and volume and sounds to be and smell just use use all of the senses and then you can remember things better well, yeah. I think we, we don't do it so you you've used this um, sort of the same technique that I described um, you've used that have you to uh, uh, to 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 good effect in exams and things like this yeah, one of the instances was um, like public speaking, where mm. you're not allowed to, you know, well, you know, you might have notes, but just in case you have to basically remember something. Mm. Um, the way you do that is with like visualizing the objects that we talked about. Yeah. Um, and another, uh, I don't know whether you've seen the uh, videos on YouTube, um, and they're sort of proving how most people or the general population don't mm. know anything essentially. Mm. And these, for some reason, the, these videos attract my attention because I guess <laughs> I, I guess I like to compare myself to yeah. the general population. I don't know, but one of the questions I'll put you on the spot now, Jake, mm. is um, can you name the planets in order? Oh yeah, I can because because the mnemonic device. I can. Right, yeah. My very. Um, hang on. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> My very easy method um, just started. Oh, I can't remember. It's something. It's my very easy method. There are plenty of different ones, but it's, you are not too far away, mate. You are yeah. not too far. You're one one uh, planet away. Um, so the, the rhyme that I was going to say yeah. was: uh, "My very enthusiastic mother just served us noodles." Uh -huh. uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus. And um, that is another memory technique you can use. And for some reason, the quirk in human, the human mind or psychology or whatever, it's easier to remember my very enthusiastic mother just served us noodles rather than, you know, just the, yeah. I guess you could refer it to uh, the linking system, it's, which it's... is another one of Darren Brown's. Um, well, Techniques. now now you mentioned that because you called him Darren Brown. I have to correct you. His name is Darren Brown. I'd like to just quickly talk about his technique, which um, which I thought was amazing for remembering people's names. Because I don't I don't know about you, but 
I actually really struggle to remember people's names, even when I want to. And, and the fact is that we just don't, we don't pay much attention to it because your memory, it, we're just thwarted by way more information than we, our brain can possibly cope with at any one given time. So the understanding at the moment is that your brain filters out stuff and says, look, that's not necessary. It, it's a bit like a computer. It's only got so much space on the hard drive. And if it just took in all of this, it would, it would just, just explode. You know, it just wouldn't, wouldn't work anymore. So, so it's constantly filtering stuff out. And when you meet someone, um, you know, most of the time you're like, hi, yeah, yeah. And it might be at a party or something or a wedding or something. There may be loads of people and you've got to meet them all. And it's very difficult to remember their names. Um, but people love to hear their names because it's the, it means them, you know, and it means someone's paid attention to them and cares about them or thinks about them or respects them. It's really important. Um, and so Darren Brown came up with a really, really good method, I think, for memorizing people's names. I, I can't remember faces very well either, so I'm really screwed. But um, his method was, uh, was this. When you meet someone, um, introduce yourself with your name. So, hi, uh, my name is Jake. Uh, and then when the other person says, hi, my name is Slim Shady, or whoever it may be. You'd um, remember that one, for sure. <laughs> yeah, there are certain names you probably would remember. <laughs> Um, but I mean, imagine they had a really obscure name, when, you know, like a, a foreign sounding name that you might not have come across before. Um, so you probably need to kind of think about um, mnemonic sort of devices or, you know, uh, a device that I, I used when I was learning Spanish, for example, which was um, a lot. I kind of used this uh, without even understanding what I was doing. I would kind of use this sort of um, visualization. So. I'd visualize certain words. An example would be the word for woman in Spanish, which is mujer. And to me, I would never remember mujer just on its own right, but I imagined someone with more hair and women generally have more hair, at least on their head. So I thought more hair and I imagined a woman. And then when I saw a woman, I thought mujer. And that's how I remembered a lot of words in Spanish actually. Um, just using this, and I, I can't even remember half of them, but, but that was one of them. And so you could use that kind of thing to remember someone who had a really weird foreign sounding name. Perhaps you could break it into its component parts, but it would work otherwise in the same way. Um, and, and this is that when you meet someone, you say, hi, my name is Jake. They say, well, you wouldn't say that. Obviously you'd say, hi, my name is Tom, but you'd say your name, they say their name, and then you repeat their name back to them. So if they say, oh, my name's Simon, you say, Simon, and they say, yeah, Simon. Uh, and then you've heard the name now three times. One time you've said it, and twice they have said it. So now you've got repetition, and it's only a little bit of repetition. On its own, it wouldn't be enough, but it's better than just someone saying, hi, my name's Simon, and you, you know, you're half paying attention. So now you're paying your full attention. And I, I must state at this point as well, it's really important in life to not try and multitask, you know, stick to one thing at a time and give it your full attention. And, um, and so when you meet someone, look them in the eye and give them your attention. You only have to give them attention for a few seconds. It's not like it's gonna steal your life away, but, but it is really important to, to give them respect and show them, you know, uh, that you, you know, you've given them your attention. So you say, hi, my name's Simon. You say, Simon, and they say, yes, yeah, Simon. Now you've got Simon three times. And at that time, then what you do is just look at them while you're shaking their hand, look at them very, very quickly in the eye and imagine somebody else, them doing an impression of someone else that you know whose name is Simon. So doing a silly impression. So if you know someone who's called Simon and you know they've got a particular characteristic or they do something or they say something or whatever that may be a little bit weird or they've got a catchphrase or whatever it may be just in my, or they have a particular smile or whatever it is just imagine for that moment this person called simon also pretending to be the simon that you know um and those the repetition and physically paying attention to someone for a moment and then visualizing them pretending to be someone you already know with the same name uh, is a really, really good way of remembering names. And if so you do that... You... I hadn't actually heard that one before. I thought that you were going to go to the, like, visualising their face as a, 
um, Darren, Ra- Darren mm. Brown uses the Mike Darren, example. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you meet someone named Mike, you picture mm. their nose as a microphone or whatever it was he used. Yeah, that's right. There are loads of different te- techniques, and he's used he uses different ones as well. But this is the one... I mean, in, in the, um, the audio book that he's done, he mentions a few, but that was the one that I found worked best for me. And perhaps, you know, the mic thing, for example, picturing their nose as a microphone might work best for you. But um, uh, the other thing is as well, if you had someone with an unusual name, you can get them to spell it out for you. So, you know, nobody minds if they say their name and they've got an unusual name. So my name is um, Darren. And you think, and you say Darren, and they say no, Darren. You say, how do you spell that? Is that D E? And they go, yeah, D E R R E N, or maybe it's just one R. I don't know. But um, and and then now you've you've kind of visualized writing in your mind. You've put more attention on it, and you you know. So this this is another way. If you don't know anyone called Darren, but maybe you do know someone called Darren, then you could like imagine that it's Darren, he's pretending to be Darren, but crossing out the, the A and writing an E or whatever it may be. Yeah. So, so I mean, these, these are the techniques. And um, I, I have to admit, when I first learned that one, I went out and used it a lot and had great success with it. And you could go around a room and you could remember people's names. And, and the funny thing is, English people in particular very rarely use names. I'm not kidding you when I say that I've worked in an office with people for months and months and months and never known their name. I don't know, <laughs> I shouldn't really admit that, but uh, I don't know if you could say the same, Tom. Uh, much worse than that. Worse than that? Yeah, far worse. Go on. Um, just people that I've met sort of over and over and over again and you know, still refer to them as mate or um, <laughs> you know, just don't, I avoid using their name altogether because yeah. I never, never, um, I, I suppose it might be more of a, I missed it the first time round and therefore mm. the, you've missed the boat then it's gone. Yeah. Uh, you, you know them well enough to know them and not, you can't then say, Oh, by the way, what's your name? Yeah. It's awkward, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, it's like, important. What? You don't know my name. We've <laughs> known each other for months. Uh, what yeah. you were saying a minute ago, but you mm. only need to pay attention for, uh, you know, a few seconds. Yeah. And it after is. that, but the other thing is it makes a much better um, it makes a much better introduction because you're looking them in the eye, you're showing them that you're confident and that you're like you're paying special attention to them just for a moment. What was your name? I mean, they may be a horrible person, and you might think, yeah, I don't want to speak to this person again. But at the same time, they may be a really nice person. And I always think that you should treat everyone with like give them a hundred points, you know, treat everyone as if they're a great person. And if they prove themselves to be otherwise, then you know. Well, you know, you don't want to spend more time with them. But, um, but a lot of people are very judgmental at the beginning uh, of, of any form of relationship or when they see someone or meet someone for the first time. First and impressions, I, isn't it? Yeah. And, and um, we all have that. I, I suffer from it as well. We all have first impressions. And there's loads of different um, uh, psychological tests which show the same person dressed up, for example, in a suit lying on the floor in a busy road um look obviously looks like he's had an accident or whatever and so you know loads of people come are you okay are you all right do you need an ambulance or whatever and then that same person looks all scruffy doesn't shave for a couple of days uh and wears sort of tramp clothes and lies in the street and everyone just avoids him you know so so it's the same person we we all we all have this we all have this thing imagine you're walking down a, a street and it's dark and they you know you're a bit nervous because it's a bit of a, a dodgy bit of town, and but you—it's just a short cut-through route, and you've been down the pub or you've been somewhere, whatever, and you're just walking through, and it's dark, and you hear footsteps behind you, you know, and the footsteps are getting closer to you. I mean, you know, you're going to start feeling pretty panicky, aren't you? You're going to be, well, should I turn around or what? And you know, and um, imagine you turn around, and you see that it's a, a you know, a, an old lady or something like that, you know. Well, then you're going to feel relaxed, right? But if it's a sort of a young guy with a baseball cap on and a hoodie, uh, you know, and he looks kind of a bit dodgy, then your reaction is going to be entirely different. And yet he might be a thoroughly nice guy. And the old granny might be hideous, horrible person, <laughs> you know. But uh, it, yes, uh, for me, that comes down to probability, though. It is. You're right. It is. And, and th- this is how people have stayed alive, you know. 
Yeah. Um, this is a really important part of, you know, our ancestors on the savannas of Africa, and they saw something that looked like a lion, they knew to avoid it. Whereas if they saw something that looked like a, an antelope, they thought, hmm, food, you know. And There's an issue is, with um, probability versus discrimination, though, isn't there? Yeah, it's a fine line. Um, yeah, they, you know, but but the the, the other thing is um, the the, uh, the the guy with the, the baseball cap and the, and the hoodie uh, he chooses to wear that. I, I remember a, a guy I used to work with who was a, a black guy, really really nice guy, but he wore he, well, he had a bit of a, an attitude problem sometimes because he'd get very angry and uh, with things, and he would say that people are all racist. And he'd say, even the black guys in security guards in the shop are racist because when I walk into a, like a 7-Eleven or, a, or a, you know, a shop like this, a, super, a mini supermarket, um, they will, they'll look at me and they'll keep an eye on me and they look like I'm going to steal something. And he goes, it's just because I'm black. And even if they're black, they still do that. And, and it, it's not, it may, there may be some truth in that. They may be, I don't know. But what I thought at that time when he said that was, it doesn't help that you you dress like a yardie, you know your 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 clothes are like street cred clothes, you know they're kind of gangster style clothes, um, and the probability is that whether you're black, white, Chinese, or wh whatever race you're from, if you're wearing those kind of clothes, you're kind of you've chosen to wear those clothes, and there's there's this is you know potentially a topic for a whole another call, but. That's your choice, you know? And if you wore a nice suit and you walked into the shop, you probably wouldn't have people looking and checking to see whether you're stealing things or not. Um, mm. But the truth of the matter is that there are racist people out there, and there's no doubt about it, that uh, a racist person may stereotype people all the time. I, I gotta say that the last time I came into the UK, I flew into the UK and uh, you know, you go through the sort of coming from the EU, nothing to declare. And I walked through there and there were three different groups of people at that very time being searched and all three of them were black and they weren't together. They were completely by chance. And I thought, now that isn't quite right, is it? I mean, it's just not right, surely. But, um, you know, maybe, maybe there's more to it. Maybe they all came from a certain plane that came from a sort of a more high risk place. I just don't know. But my, my reaction to it was that that looks like uh, stereotyping and the, you know, uh, well, I can tell you from my experience of um, going through airports, they like mm. to search the, uh, the young men. Um, oh, you've been searched. Have you? Probably because of the drugs issue. Um, but they always pick me for some reason. Because maybe, maybe if I wore a suit, <laughs> next time I go through an airport, I'll wear a suit and see what happens. That's that's funny because I years ago I um I went on an aeroplane and I, and I arrived at the air. Uh, well, funny enough, I I was going Air New Zealand from Fiji to America to Los Angeles when I was doing my round the world trip. I was nineteen, and I I always panicked. I was always a little bit scared going through security gut, you know, security at airports. But I I got there and there was a. Um, I actually arrived at the airport early and the people when I got there said, look, I'm sorry, we've overbooked the flight. Um, and would you mind going on another flight? We can get you on the Qantas flight instead. And I thought, well, no, because this flight goes to Hawaii and I want to go to Hawaii. But it was in truth only a stopover. I'd have been in Honolulu for a few hours and then get on another plane. So uh, I thought, well, no, I'm, I'm happy to go on this. And they said, well, we'll pay you $350 uh, and the plane leaves later, and it's a direct flight to Los Angeles. So you'll get there earlier than if you were going to go via Hawaii. Uh, and we'll take you out to the best hotel. Um, and you can go to the restaurant and you can order whatever you want. Well, and I was left. sold on the $350. Yes. <laughs> Sorry? If you just said yes right away, then you missed out there. Wouldn't you? <laughs> I would have, yeah. So, so I, I obviously, I, I mean, the thing is, I was still two months away from my, the end of my journey, and I had $100 left. So, the three hundred and fifty dollars was, was was what sold it to me, but they were they they saw the sort of it, it, I wanted to just go to Hawaii just so that I could say I'd been to Hawaii, um, but that three hundred and fifty dollars was sort of <laughs> it was a deal breaker. Uh, deal breaker. But anyway, so I, I went to this hotel, and there were these three Americans who'd also agreed to the same trip, 
same deal. And we got taken in a limousine, believe it or not, to the hotel. Uh, and we, we spent hours in this amazing restaurant, probably one of the best ones in the whole of Fiji, and ate whatever we wanted on the menu, drank whatever we wanted. And then we were chauffeured back to the, uh, to the airport. Um, and when we got back to the airport, we'd all got to know each other on the flight, of, uh, on, you know, at the meal. Um, and we'd all had a little bit of uh, wine and we were in a good mood. We got there, and as we got there, the American said, oh, you watch, uh, I should have used the mnemonics uh, method, or I, was like, I can't remember what his name was, but let's just call him Johnny. So he always gets searched going through customs. You watch, he'll get searched this time. <laughs> and, um, and he goes, oh, I hate, so I hate it. And he was so nervous, and he was sweaty and all the rest of it. And lo and behold, as we got through, guess who got taken aside and searched? <laughs> it, was, it was Johnny, for whatever his name was. And um, yeah, he, he got searched apparently every single time he went through. And he'd been going on a round the world trip as well. So he'd been through a lot of airports. Ah, <laughs> oh, the poor guy. Um, you look a bit suspicious. Have you, have you watched Lie to Me recently? Uh, well, I binge watched it, mm. but um, not recently. Yeah. Well, I started watching it again the other day and it is fantastic. Um, it's using micro expressions to sort of uh, analyze what people are really thinking. Um, and um, yeah, there's no doubt about it. If you feel a bit nervous, then maybe you're exhibiting things that make you, you know, look more likely, you know, more like you're, uh, well, if, if you're nervous walking through an airport, you're going to, you're going to sort of stand out from people who seem confident, I suppose. And, uh, you know, you're certainly you're not, to hide not nerves for me It's probably, I mean, there might be nothing to it. It could be, you know, coincidental, which uh, based on the amount of times that I've traveled, it's highly possible. Um, but it wouldn't set, it wouldn't take much to set me off about freedom and invasion of privacy and all this stuff. So <laughs> more likely to be that they wouldn't have to do much for me to start getting punchy about the whole process of going on a plane. Well, one thing's for sure. You definitely are, um, you know, you're, you're definitely getting searched more than I am. I've never been searched. And I, I cannot <laughs> count the number of times I've been through security. I've only been searched once, and that was when I was 18 years old. And it wasn't on a plane. It was coming back from Morocco on a boat. But then they searched the entire boat. <laughs> Everyone, it took hours to get off the boat because every single person was searched by the, uh, by the Guardia Civil um, in Spain. Every single last person. All of our items, everything. So... Yeah. Oh, no, I actually got searched once. My, my, uh, my bag got searched coming in um, at Dover as well once from France. Once. But, um, but that was it. The, the rest of it, you know, I've just gone through with flying colors, um, you know. But uh, yeah, you're definitely doing something wrong there, Tom. But when, when it comes to memory, I don't really think I know any other techniques. I did buy... Um, I told you before, I, I bought this uh, really cool thing. I bought a, a deck of cards, and each card, there was 50 or 52 of them, like a, a deck of normal cards. But each of these cards was a memory technique, and it explained how to do that memory technique. And I thought, wow, I'm going to buy that. And I bought that, and I thought, I'm going to learn all of these and have the best memory ever. Um, and then I promptly forgot where I put the cards, so <laughs> I have no idea where they are now. That's um, it. Yeah, I'll do a um a special mention if that's all right with you, and that's um mm. to uh, investigate how you learn best. So some people visual, some people audio, or some people are text. Or yeah, um, and once you know sort of what sort of soaks into your brain mm. easiest, that's obviously when you want to spend most of your time. Um, and uh, sort of playing games has been. Is supposed to be another one which um, which uh, helps because it uses so many different um, so many of those different strategies so um, mm. I mean I know that that's not entirely practical but um, you know if you can somehow um, add all of those various things into your learning process then I think that would probably be uh, beneficial well I, I tell you a friend of mine Andy um, he has an incredible memory for numbers. Uh, when he was young, uh, when we were sort of teenagers, 15, 16, he was very popular with the girls. And uh, we'd go out and he'd always be getting girls' phone numbers. That was obviously in the time before 
uh, before Facebook and all the rest of it. So I don't know how people do it these days. But um, back then, you you know, you, you, you had to get phone numbers. And you know, you're in a pub or a bar. He shouldn't have been because he was 15 or 16, naughty. But he was. And, um, and so was I. And, you, you know, you don't have things to hand to, to write down numbers. So he would just remember them. And I don't know that what mnemonic or, or uh, linking or any other kind of technique. There's, there's all sorts of techniques that I've come across when I was looking at this. Method of Loki, um, major system, peg system, role learning, um, uh, which is basically repetition, uh, uh, all sorts of things. But he would remember numbers. And years later, I asked him, I thought, can you still remember numbers? You used to be really good at remembering girls' numbers. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, how many numbers can you remember? And he goes, I don't know, 30 or 40, I think, in a row. And I went, that's just nonsense. There's no way you can remember that. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. And so I wrote down some numbers. And I said, OK, let's just randomly write down a bunch of numbers. And I wrote them down on a piece of paper. And I gave him a, like a minute to look at them. And then I said, um, what, what can you remember? And he, he told me all the numbers. And there were about 30 of them. I thought, that's amazing. So I wrote down 40, and he remembered them. Then I wrote down 60 numbers, and he remembered all 60. And a few months later, out of the blue, I, um, I kept the piece of paper in my wallet. And a few months later, out of the blue, uh, I asked him. I saw him again, and I asked him, do you remember those numbers? And he went, oh, I don't know. Uh, I said, go on, have a go. And he goes, hang on. And then he, he remembered all 60 numbers. It just blew my mind. Unless he's some sort of gifted individual, that's, uh, that's what we talked about today, I think. Mm. You know, that's the, the memory palace. Or... Well, I think he, he, he did say that he kind of remembers them in sequences. So he kind of broke them into, like, telephone numbers. So he'd obviously worked out a system as a teenager of remembering phone numbers, which were six numbers long. And he just kind of broke them into a series of six. Mm. And he broke each number into a series of three, he said. So he remembers three numbers and then three and then three and then three. But each one is like a two groups of three together form a phone number. And um, and he could he could remember him as like ten different girls. <laughs> so I don't know what that says about his mind. <laughs> one, was there Brown, are, uh, one was brunette, you know. You know. There are um, some bands, aren't there? So uh, yeah. there are examples of uh, sort of individuals yeah. who are particularly gifted who can remember whole phone books. That's right. There, there was what there was a, another documentary which I think I told you to read. Uh, to read, hello, uh, to watch. Um, I think it's called "The Boy with the Amazing Brain" or something. And um, it's a British savant uh, whose name I've forgotten because I'm not a savant, although I am British, um, so I'm halfway there. Uh, and he has something called synesthesia. He's um, not. He's a savant, which means he's obviously, you know, gifted um, in that way. He was the one, he went to Oxford University and he recited pi to 15,000 digits, I think it was, or 25,000 digits or 50,000 digits. I don't know how many it was, but it was extraordinary. He, he sat there on a chair and they had all these mathematicians from Oxford University um, sitting there with lists of pi. And he started and he had, a, you know, a bottle of water and he just spent all morning reciting them, 3.14, blah, 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 blah. And he went on and on and on and on. And the, the really cool thing for me was then he then said the, f the final digit, and he goes, that's it. That's 15,000. <laughs> and it's just like not only did he get them all right, but he knew exactly how many there were and when to stop. And I, I just thought that was extraordinary. And people, you know, they, they're all blown away by this. And they're saying, how did you remember them all? And he said that he has synesthesia. And synesthesia is a bit like what we were talking about before. Um, it's a bit like having a, a, a memory palace for numbers or for something else. It's when two senses overlap. And people who've done um, uh, LSD, lysergic acid, you know, which makes you hallucinate, um, while they're under the influence of that drug, they are synesthetic, or a lot of them are synesthetic, or they can be synesthetic. Um, and um, you know, I actually experimented that when I was a, a young man. I don't know if I ever told you. I would never do it again. I certainly wouldn't recommend it. 
but I was interested, so I, I experimented with it. And, and I became synesthetic in that time. The other f f funny thing under the influence of that, that drug, in fact, was that um, everything becomes pixelated. Now, we've talked previously about, uh, about you know, are we living in a simulation? And part of it is that, it, you know, it would be pixelated in some way. And the funny thing is, if you, if you ever have done that drug, you will discover that under the influence of that drug, everything is, is both pixelated and you're synesthetic, which means that you, your, your senses cross over, that you can uh, see smells and, and, um, you know, and, you're, and you know, you can feel letters and things like this, they, they will get mixed up. It's very <laughs> Can you feel letters or do you think that you can feel letters? I don't know. It's, 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 it's a bit of a weird thing. I mean, technically, you think you can feel letters and you hear people think that they can fly. And like I said, um, I definitely wouldn't do it ever again. Um, but, you know, I did experiment with it um, as I'm a bit of a sort of, uh, you know, I have a bit of an open mind and I like to, when, when my youth, I, I like to experiment. And I always, I always had my life stuck into different sections, you know, and I was happy to do something in this section and then you know, when I got a bit older, when I, when, I, when I got married, then I would go into the sort of married stage and, you know, but I wanted to do stuff while I was in certain stages. And one of the things I wanted to do was experiment with LSD because I, it, it kind of, I found, it, I was inquisitive about it. It, it sort of, you know, I, I couldn't understand what it was and I tried it and um, yeah, and it was mind blowing literally, but uh, I, I, it's kind of, I don't know it's a good idea to mess with your mind in that way. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, there are, um, there are lots of people, quite influential people actually, mm -hmm. saying that you should, um, providing you don't have any addiction problems, that you should mm -hmm. experiment with these types of drugs. Yeah. And I don't like the odds. Um, obviously, the odds are very small mm -hmm. uh, that something detrimental is going to happen to you. Yeah. Even if that's the case, I don't, I don't like those odds. So I've never done anything like that. No, well, I wouldn't recommend to do it, to be honest, because it's, um, it's not. I used to smoke a lot of weed when I was at university, and my, my university uh, uh, education definitely suffered as a consequence, partly because smoking the weed just made everything feel much more mellow. And, you know, you don't get bored when, you're, when you smoke weed because you can find, any, you know, you look at something and, and anything's fascinating, you know. Uh, and also, you, you the, the one thing I would t say from it is that you really live in the here and now. Your your full focus is on whatever is around you at that time. And then after, you know, so you've got no memory. If you're watching a movie on having smoked weed, um, you will put all of your focus on to whatever's going on in that particular scene. And it's almost like you can't remember what's just happened, but you live it with an intensity. And the same with music. You might hear bits of the percussion or something you never noticed before you know they're always there but you kind of you listen to the whole thing normally but now you might focus specifically on different bits of the sound yeah. um, that make up the music and it's so you never get bored and um it's amazing from that point of view and and i and you know i loved it and i smoked it far more than i should have done and i also like video games and movies and i and i watched star trek the next generation completely and totally blasted um and probably you know it probably isn't very very good production value i don't know but that doesn't really matter when when you know when you're baked because you um you know you don't mind everything is easy um and you know you just you when you see a normal movie you've got characters in the background and i would like i wonder who who are these people what's their backstory what are they doing here how do they feel about this and I and I lose the actual plot, literally in more ways than one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I would find little sub stories that weren't there really or weren't meant to be there, um, and it was it was great. But at, at the end of the day, it stole away my own life. You know what I mean? I felt like uh, I didn't have any interest in sort of getting up and doing things and learning new things and getting on with my life i was just like apathetic and i hated that and so i stopped um and that's that's why i stopped it i mean i loved the feeling of it but i just also didn't actually i also didn't like being sort of when i needed to be awake and alert uh i couldn't find that and it took me a few days after not smoking any 
to 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 recover my alertness. And I think it was John Lennon who said that um, uh, being straight was the best drug that he'd ever tried. And and I have to agree with that. You know, w- once I stopped smoking dope, my brain just became so much better. It was just I, I didn't, hadn't realised, you know, that I'd just been dulling my senses. And I, I, I'm saying this, it's not as if I was a huge heavy smoker, but, um, you know, I smoke most days a little bit, you know, especially in the evening just to chill out. Well, that's quite an, an apt place for me to mm. add what we what we talked about, which was, um, and I don't know whether you have anything, but mine was uh, a positive message to end the call. Ah, um, go for it. And in relation to what you just said, mm. uh, I heard that when you um, when you exercise or when you sort of work out or something in that mm. sort of realm, um, you yeah. get a mental high that you that can't be competed with uh, because it ends with a sense of pride. Mm. So um, if you push yourself and you get that get those endorphins that get sort of sparked, and um, you you don't sort of give up at the first sight of failure, you keep going yeah. and you can take that away with you and you feel proud of yourself. Mm. Um, and you, you should take that over any form of drug or anything like that. Yeah. So that's my Absolutely. positive message to end the call. Do you have something like, um, what, what did you say that you wanted to, um, I don't know. I just thought I'd come out with a thought, a thought uh, of the day. Yeah, well, maybe a thought of the day. Thought you of know, the day or a thought of the call, maybe. A thought of the call, yeah, perhaps. Um, so in relation to this, I, I just wanted to say the, because um, I, I go off track and, you know, I go off on a tangent. And, um, uh, you know, the, the synesthesia thing, the, the boy who knew uh, who, with, the, with the amazing brain, uh, he, I just wanted to finish saying that he, um, he saw Pi as a walk in the woods because he was synesthetic, he saw numbers as colors and shapes. And so he had memorized um, a particular walk. So if you went for a walk through your town or through the countryside, you might see a big tree and you might notice a building over there and a farm building or whatever it may be. And to him, all of the trees or all of the, the buildings along his walk were numbers in pi because the synesthesia is the, the, um, the two senses crashing together. And the sense is, in fact, three, visual um, in terms of color, uh, well, two, I suppose, visual in terms of color and, and shape and the number. And so when he saw the number seven, it would have a particular shape and color. And so for him, it was very easy just to visualize um, Pi as a as sort of mentally as a walk along through the countryside or through a town or something. And all of the, you know, and he'd just be looking at the numbers as, they, as he went along. But he could do extraordinary mathematics using this system as well. And he said he would, he would just, um, uh, he wouldn't ever have to think of the mathematical answer. He would just visualize what it looked like um, and what color and what shape it was. And that would be the number. So that's synesthesia, which is why I got off on a tangent there about the drugs. But I, I would suggest that um, it's really, really important to be inquisitive, uh, but not to take unnecessary risks. The problem with drugs is that um, they're illegal, which means that they're in the hands of all sorts of really shady people who don't mind breaking rules and who can get involved in some really nasty, nasty things. And what that means is that um, you don't know what things are being mixed with and you don't know what the quality of the drugs are. Um, I, I rarely drink any alcohol these days and I, I, you know, I feel much better being healthy. As, as Tom knows, I... Uh, I, I do alternate, 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 I can't even say it now, alternate day fasting, um, where I, where I, um, I, I restrict my calories uh, on one day and then eat normally the, the following day. Um, and this has kept my, my health and my, my weight on, in line. And, um, and, and this has been good for me, but might not be good for others. But uh, I also have started doing a bit more exercise. Um, and I agree fully with what, with what, you said, Tom, you know, um, eat healthy, look after your body. It's, uh, it's yours. It's going to last you a lifetime. If you had a car, um, you know, and you didn't look after it, you would expect it to break down eventually. Um, but you can always replace a car. I mean, it might cost, might be costly. You might not be able to afford to straight away, but eventually you could have another car. 
but with your body, you only get the one. And it's going to last you a lifetime, so you should really look after it. It's um, interesting how your points sort of um, come to uh, the next call. So what I was about to say is, for now, we only have one body. But um, in the future, you know, you never know how you might be able to replace things with uh, robotics. And yeah. what I was about to say was... Um, that's true. Did you want to do our next call on technology? Technology. Yeah, I really do. Okay. Yeah, so my, my thought of the day is that it's, it's look after your body, um, treat it with respect because it's going to last you a lifetime, or does it? <laughs> Maybe we can replace them, and we'll talk about that in the next call. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right. Well, I'll speak to you then. All right, Jake. Right, take it easy, Tom. Bye. Bye.